welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our very first virtual production with the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Michelle Miao. If you're joining us for the first time, the Michelle Miao Show is your A through Z covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. With our special partnership with the Commonwealth Club that I get to do, I do it with my co-host, John Zipper, who's the vice president of media at the club. Say hello, John. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, John. Hello, Michelle. Good to have you back. Yeah. Um, You know, first, before we begin the program, I do want to stress that this is such a fortunate opportunity to be able to continue doing what we do. I mean, human connection is what we're all about. And the program is dedicated to having these conversations that touch on social justice issues, but with an intersectional lens, meaning we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And so uh, while we're able to be fortunate enough to do this, though, the club does need your help. And so if you have the opportunity to do that, visit uh, uh, the site at commonwealthclub.org and help us out. Um, Anything you want to add to that, John? I would just add that you can see all of our upcoming online programs listed at commonwealthclub.org slash online and we will be adding more programs practically every day so and because the program is virtual uh, you may ask questions and we'll we'll get your questions later on in the program but let's get started i'm excited if, if i could just yeah if you're watching on youtube go ahead and use the chat thing to a- ask questions Got it. yeah that's right we're gonna it's gonna take some getting used to this so <laughs> Ask your questions via the chat box, and they'll make sure to get it to us later in the program. So let's introduce our guest, and we're super excited to have him here, Steve Disselhorse, who is the author of his new book. It's not out yet, but we'll tell you when it is coming out, Determined to Be a Dad, A Journey of Faith, Resilience, and Love. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here uh, in the midst of everything that's happening in the world. I think you said it really best. It's about human connections and we can't physically connect with people. We're going to be doing it virtually today. So I'm really excited. I know that I've got some folks out there that are, um, are, are getting online and, um, it's just, it's exciting that we can create a virtual community. So thank you so much for having me. Well, let's begin. Let's start with, it is tradition here on the program that we ask all our guests, uh, their coming out story, but you, you have a great, lead up to the actual coming out. Let's start with young Steve growing up yeah. in an Irish Catholic family uh, in the Chicago area and yeah. kind of what that was like and how that led to, you know, a lot of uh, of the uh, identity finding for Steve. Yeah. So, um, so I grew up, you know, in a, I had, I have three siblings with my parents and, um, We have a very large extended family. Both of my parents have um, uh, come from families of five. So I have about 25 first cousins, very close. Uh, We did a lot of things together. I mean, family was um, something that for me was the fabric of my being from the very beginning. And um, I always envisioned having a family of my own. Um, And I always thought, um, growing up in really a heterosexual environment that that would mean I would marry a woman and that that's how I would create a family. Um, and I just loved it. I loved everything about, um, these connections. I, I have cousins that are all over the world that I connect with that are, and it's just like amazing, um, how close we were to all of our, our cousins and, and our relatives. And, and that, that holds up true today. Um, It was really in my late teens, um, early 20s, that I really um, was confronted with the reality that I was attracted to men. And um, I struggled really uh, for a long time with that, um, really grappled with that. Um, And it was was a really hard time for me um, to really reconcile that I had this, really this vision of who I was as a person and all of a sudden that vision and that world was, uh, was not true anymore. Um, and so I, um, I went through a period of, you know, a time of great difficulty in accepting that. Um, and then um, finally came out to, um, I started to, you know, meet a few people. But then uh, finally I remembered very clearly um, I was, the, I'm the youngest of my siblings. And so I was living at home. I this was, 
um, after I'd graduated college and um, was working in downtown Chicago and commuting downtown. And I think it was on a Friday night that I told my parents that I thought I might be bisexual um, as a way to... Um, and I, I was telling myself that that was sort of the acceptable thing to do. And I told my parents um, that I was bisexual or maybe gay. And <clears throat> my father... Um, he uh, he was going to be a priest. He was a very religious man, and um, it was very hard on him. So he broke down and was crying. And my mother, um, she uh, I think she was standing sort of at the kitchen sink or preparing some food, and she just turned to me and she said, "Well, even if you're gay, you you need to eat your dinner." And it was just <laughs> this off sort of lightness and um, and this comment that just was like wow okay okay and so we sat and we talked and um you know i remember the conversation really well but i remember walking away from it and i remember that they loved me and they supported me um they i and i clearly they didn't understand um they really didn't understand what i was going through but they the foundation of love and um support was there um so that that's my you know that's my coming out uh, my really big, most memorable coming out story. Well, you talk about uh, <clears throat> kind of feeling this conflict between what you thought your life was going to be like and that's how a family gets formed and such, yeah. and then realizing your life is going to take a dip, bit of a different track. And today, I think, you know, we have LGBT families out there and, yes. and you know, famous and all, all different fields. So people can kind of look and see yep. that and, and yep. see, okay, that's that can be done. Yeah. Um, but how important do you think that would have been when you were going yeah. through it to be able to see this basketball player, this, this actor yeah. and actress and all that kind of stuff? So I, I mean, it would have been incredibly important because at the time that I came out, it was really a binary choice. So um, it was, you know, get married to a woman and have a family or in my mind at the time it was be gay and be single um, and it really felt like this binary choice and, and it was the early nineties. So it was really the height of the AIDS epidemic when I came out. And so the idea of coming out to live a life as a gay man was terrifying, right? It was, it was all risk. It was the act of the act of love and affection to another human being, um, was an act of potentially being, uh, exposed. Um, this was before antivirals. This was when, you know, it was really, um, the, the, the uh, AIDS epidemic, it was really very scary at that time. Um, so it was a really difficult choice. And I would say the first several years after coming out, I was very, um, I was very safe about how I was interacting with other men. Um, but I was, you know, going slowly through my journey of trying to figure out who I wanted to be and how I wanted to be. But it was, it was a really challenging time. There weren't role models for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went through a period, and I write about this in my book, I went through a period of mourning the loss of family. I thought um, that I could have a family with a spouse, but I didn't think I would have children. So there was a period where I really... Um, mourn the idea of being a father and it was uh it was very it was hard but i also knew i couldn't couldn't put away like my um my sexual orientation my attractions to men and i also really wanted to fall in love so i i i spent you know the 90s pretty much into the early 2000s really dating and exploring relationships and learning about myself um yeah i want to go back to um <clears throat> the very beginning, there's a, the intro page and you come out and identify yourself right away as a white cisgender privileged gay m male, yes. you know, yes. raising children in the San Francisco Bay area. Yes. Um, I don't think we share a lot of honest, authentic stories of what it's like to one, grow up in a religious household as a, a <coughs> white cisgender gay man and be closeted and then yeah. do a, bunch of things to yourself that uh, lots of people would not normally do as kids, yeah. which is pretend to be somebody yep. else. Yep. Um, you know, yeah. join football teams, be super athletic, yeah. pretend to be straight and macho. Yep. Uh, you know, talk about, you know, kind of how that also led to you seeking help 
in grounding yourself to to be able to be the Steve you are today? Yeah, I mean, um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think I ran from myself for a long time. Um, I, um, I was a very busy um, person. As a, as a young person, I was very busy. I started working very, um, I had a, a, several jobs. I was a paper boy f early on. I had a lot of jobs and then I was very engaged at school, but I think what you're really getting to is that um, it was around the sixth grade. I remember, you know, my parents took my sister and myself to Florida, and I remember looking into these beautiful blue eyes, and I was transfixed on this person. And then all of a sudden, I looked down and I realized it was a boy, and I was like, "This is not who I am." There was a message immediately to myself that I needed to hide. Um, and there was also a period that I went through in my life that I wanted to dress and, you know, do play, play dress up in girls clothes. And um, it was part of my self exploration. And I hid that I hid that away. I hid it away from my family. I did it at one of my cousin's houses. And it was, um, it was really in those moments where you don't trust yourself. Um, and you also certainly don't trust the people around you. Um, and I think there was a lot of that that happens and it happens to a lot of us as gay people is we because we're alone when we when we're young we're alone our families I mean today it's changing it's different there are people that are encouraging their kids to to be whatever they want you see it um, here in San Francisco um, but in other places it's still very heteronormative and so um, I see it my son's four years old I see the behaviors of the boys versus the girls really early on and so you take that all in and you 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 um you don't necessarily know yourself and you don't necessarily trust yourself i think trust is such a big part of it um so it took a long time i would say that um my relationship with my husband has been transformative in building trust um and so it's taken me you know a long time in like uh, to, to be able to, and also just really to trust myself. And so um, I think, you know, I've had these life experiences in the last couple of years that have really, um, really been challenging and they've made me go inside. Um, whereas in many cases, I was looking outside for answers and I've um, moved more to going internal to figure out who am I really, who am I? Um, and so I think, I think that's where you're going with this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's very important, especially if you want to form a family uh, <coughs> yeah. that, you know, you don't create those barriers. And I think yeah. as parents, sometimes you don't even realize what barriers you're putting up, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. for your kids. And we'll, we'll talk a, a lot more yeah. later yeah. about what it's like to raise your kids right now during this, yeah. you know, pandemic. Yeah. Uh, but, but you mentioned your husband. So I think we'll, we'll pivot there and we'll, yeah. we'll talk about, um, meeting your husband, Lori, Lori yeah. Vick. Lori Vick, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, what was that? How did that go? Um, it was, it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was life changing, right? Like, so we met um, on a Sunday uh, at the Eagle, um, which is a very well known bar in, in the city. Um, he was there with some friends for beer bust. I was there um, with uh, a friend for a fundraiser. The, the Eagle on Sundays often has fundraisers. So it was, um, it was 2003, my friend Jeff um, and I had gone to the gay games together in Sydney. There, he was on the swim team and they had like overspent their budget. So they had this fundraiser and we were just there hanging out on a, on a Sunday. And um, we, met, we met that day and, um, and we, um, there was for me and I think for him as well, an immediate connection. He was, he was involved with someone else at the time. And um, so we, um, we just kind of got to know each other that day. And, um, and then, you know, over the next, say, four or five months, we kind of kept running into each other. There was this sort of um, coincidental aspect of we kept seeing each other. And, um, and then we, you know, we started to date and, um, and then things just went from there. Yeah. You had kids right away. <laughs> no, we didn't. John. Well, but well, the name of the book is "Determined to Be Dad." Yeah. So when did 
in all, all this evolution you were going through, when did you realize this is something you could do and you were going to do it? So, I mean, so I think I said earlier, you know, I, I kind of mourned the loss mm -hmm. of, of being a parent in the early 90s and was just really trying to figure out who the heck I was. Um, it was really kind of towards the late 90s where society started to change. Um, you know, we started to see more acceptance and... I think I started to, and I, and I had dated a lot and had um, been unsuccessful in relationships. And so I was like, started to come back to, I, like, I want to be a parent. And at, that was around 2000. And it was really, um, I said to myself, do I want to give up on this dream of falling in love? And do, or do I want to move directly to kids? And I kind of was like, if you have a kid, it's hard to fall, harder to fall in love. So I was like, let's give it some more time. And, um, and I'm, uh, of course I'm, and I also was like, you know, the reality is like parenting, um, with someone else is really, you know, it's a beautiful thing. Right. And especially for people, LGBTQ people who go through incredible, um, stress creating our families, um, because of the fact that, you know, we, um, especially for gay men, we, we can't procreate. So it's really challenging. And so having a partner by your side to go through that is really amazing. So, um, so yeah, so that's, um, kind of then we, when we met, um, we were at, you know, sort of different places in our lives. And then, you know, we spent time like, you know, the honeymoon period and getting to know each other and then, you know, buying a house together and, you know, doing a lot of things together. And then, and then we finally got to the point where I was like, I'm ready. And my husband, um, he, Lorvik, he was, um, he wanted to do his MBA. I had completed my MBA. And so we, we were like, okay, let's do that. And then we did that. And then we started the process. So I think for LGBTQ people, like, um, you know, when you decide to have your kid, it doesn't happen very fast. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's a, it's a long journey. Um, and so it's like, you've got to add on time for that. So let's talk about the process of, uh, having your first child, you yeah. decided open adoption. Yeah. Um, yeah. what's open adoption? So open adoption is, um, is where the birth parents, the biological parents, or some call it the first family that that's where those parents decide on who's going to adopt the child. So it's, it's their decision. They're saying, I'm placing my child for adoption and I choose you. So it's in some ways sort of like um, match.com. Um, so we went through an agency called um, Independent Adoption Center and they basically have this big long process, but at the end of it, you create a profile. Um, we created a website and basically all the um, prospective parents are on that website and um, uh, birth mothers and birth fathers, as they're considering uh, placing their children for adoption, they can go to that site and they can read about you and read the bio. And so in our case, we started in April. Um, in April, we went quote unquote live in the system in April of uh, 2010, right? Okay, so 10 years ago, we went live. And... Um, we, uh, the agency tells you, gives you a window, like, you know, like 12 to 24 months is a normal wait time. Our social worker that we had at the time said, well, you guys, interracial couple, um, for both professionals, you know, you'll probably get picked earlier. You'll probably, um, get called pretty soon. And like really very quickly, we started getting phone calls and, um, and the first, woman that we met. Um, so let me just tell you quickly overall, over two years period of time, we had 14 different women contact us. Um, so that's uh, about one contact every two months. So imagine the, the roller coaster of, you know, like meeting someone and, you know, being, um, trying to, uh, adopt their child that happened to us 14 different times, different, different lengths of engagements. Um, but it was, uh, it was a roller coaster ride. Our first um, birth mother that we uh, encountered was an amazing woman. She already had a child. She was, um, she, she was 
pregnant with a, a, a different um, partner at the time and she just recognized that like she couldn't really um, finish school. She was in college, she couldn't finish school and she couldn't do the things and give her son the life she wanted. So she decided, and we had a great engagement with her and then when we were about to go meet her, she, the agency called and said that she had decided on another family. Uh, so, so when she's, when you're getting these calls from these people, yeah. they probably have called a number of people, in other words. At, yeah, at I mean, of... so, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all over. It's random. I mean, in, in this day and age, it's, you know, some of it is just texting or emailing or IM. I mean, it's, it's all over. So some of them, because on your profile, you have a 1-800 number that gets routed to your phone. So they can just call you directly. Um, others will call the agency and they'll ask the agency to get information about who you are, and then the agency will call you. But we had like, I mean, we, we, I joke about it in the book, we joke about it, Lorvik and I, it was like hot potato, like the phone would ring, it would be like a number we didn't know, and it was like, who's gonna answer, right? And then it was like, you know, cause it's nerve wracking, right? Like, and so um, that was, you know, that was kind of the process, yeah. Sure. yeah. What was it like as a gay couple um, knowing that, you know, lots of your potential, uh, I guess, children who would come yeah. out of you know, these calls, um, you're up against other people who are looking to adopt. Yeah, so um, I think, so we did a, a good amount of due diligence on the adoption agency and we landed on the agency that we landed on. They're no longer open, but they had about 25% of prospective adoptive parents were LGBTQ. So they were really open. Um, at the time that we started in 2010, both my husband and I were completely out and we were, we were out at work, out completely out in our personal lives. And we were pretty adamant that we would only work with an agency that was completely embracing of LGBTQ people. And so we found that there. Um, as far as um, other families, you know, it was, um, it was, you know, it was hard. I mean, the first one, the first actually woman that we connected with and was very promising. She ended up um, with a, a, a lesbian couple. She ended up placing her child with a lesbian couple. So, you know, it was hard. It's hard. Like you're, you like, we, we were ready. Like at that point we were like ready. Um, so, you know, you feel, you feel a lot of loss and, um, you know, it's, chal it's challenging. Did any of those birth parents raise your, uh, raise the issue of your, uh, no, no, we, we actually had, um, uh, being LGBTQ, um, was really not, um, it was not an issue that came up mm -hmm. as a deterrent. The people that had were offended by us, just never called us, right? Like, right. so the pool of people that came to us were people that were, um, you know, very open to um, LGBTQ. We, we did hear um, from our adoption agency social workers that um, two men adopting, actually, they told us like, um, for the birth moms, it's easier because they don't feel like they're being replaced. Interesting. Whereas if they um, are placing a child with a heterosexual couple or um, with two women that the birth mom, it's harder because they feel like, cause the child could, could believe that either one of those women were their biological mothers. Whereas, so they, they said to us, you know, some of the women actually really prefer because they, they, their identity as being the, the mother, the one that brought them into the world can never be replaced. Um, so we were like, yay, we're finally having an advantage for being two gay men. <laughs> like, this is great. Like, um, so yeah, that was one of the kind of the upshots. Yeah. So tell us, you know, tell us that that moment you got the call, you knew you were having a baby. So it went very quickly. So we, as I said, had 14 women contact us. Um, and the last year, um, we had very little contact and, um, Lorvik and I were getting really, uh, we were getting really, um, and just, uh, we, f we, we felt like we couldn't, we couldn't make it happen. We started to question really, was it in our, what is it in our plans? Was this really meant to happen? And we, um, we actually went and saw some friends to, 
talk to them about potentially going through surrogacy. We were like, we want to do this. Um, so it was, um, the day after Easter, so I'm Catholic, <laughs> and, and it was the day after Easter that we got a phone call um, from our agency. They said there's a family um, that saw your profile. They received your profile over the weekend, and um, they'd like to talk to you. And we were like ecstatic, and they gave us uh, the phone number, and it was um, a birth mother and a birth father. And most of our contacts had, uh, ha had always been just birth mothers. There was very few interactions with birth fathers, but this contact, it was the birth father that actually wanted to talk to us. So that was different. And um, it was a Monday, they gave us his phone number and I called him um, and had first, first conversation with him. And it was really nerve wracking and scary. He was really nervous. We were really nervous, um, but we also really connected. And then um, Lorvik had a conversation with him I believe the, the same day or the next day, um, and that was Tuesday, um, and then we had multiple conversations, and then on Wednesday, the um, social worker called us and said, you know, maybe you guys should think about going to LA to meet this family. Um, so on Thursday after work, we drove down to LA, um, and on Friday, we met them at noon, and um, we spent five hours with them. It was the first time we met the birth mom, and it was like, We'd only been talking to the birth father and, we, and he'd said, you know, she doesn't really want, she's, she's kind of quiet. She doesn't really want to talk on the phone. And then we met her and um, she was very talkative. And we, um, we, you know, like had just this incredible five hour connection. At the end of it, they were like, you know, we'd like to place our, our, our daughter with you. Um, and so that was really amazing. So that was on a Friday. Then the next day we went and saw an ultrasound of her. Um, on Saturday and then Sunday we drove back from LA and we were, we were told we've got about three or four weeks until uh, our daughter's going to be born. We got back to the Bay. Um, it was probably late on Sunday night. I took that Monday off and we, we had nothing in our house for a child. So they, they tell you for adoption, don't, don't create a baby room. Don't buy stuff. Cause it makes the weight so much. So we had nothing. And on Monday, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to, you know, Babies R Us and start to buy things. And then at like two o'clock in the afternoon, birth father called and said, um, birth mom's going to the hospital. She's, she's going to be induced. Wow. And it was like, what? We had a car seat because that was required for um, the home study. So we had a car seat and... Um, we, I mean, I ran to the store and bought bottles and formula and a bassinet and like really very basic things and brought it home. And then Lorva came home from work. And then two hours later, we got in the car again, drove back to LA, went straight to the hospital and checked in to the room next to, um, birth mom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, and then that was, then she was born the next day. So were you in the room? Yeah, so we were. So um, it was, uh, it was just, it was uh, really a amazing, incredible experience. You know, having just met someone, having just met this couple five days before, you know, um, giving birth is just in a most intimate and, um, precious time and they wanted us there for every step of the way. And, um, our daughter was born on uh, a Tuesday evening late and, and the day was about 10 PM, but we spent the entire day, um, with the birth family and they invited their extended family. And they, like, we were in the middle of, um, all of these people that were strangers and we were all waiting to bring, our daughter into the world. And, um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. We were there. We saw, you know, everything. Um, I was, you know, trembling with just joy. And so my husband Lorvik was there and he held our daughter for the first time. And then I cut her umbilical cord and, mm -hmm. and then I held her and, um, that was the beginning. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was really amazing. So so amazing that you decided to do it a second time <laughs> <laughs> you you have yeah two kids. so um but like you said you did it a different route we right? did we did yeah. you know the thing is we had our daughter um and 
it was great. We, you know, like the first year and a half of parenting is really kind of just like a blur and first year and a half to two years is really pretty much a blur. And I think, um, I think for, I'll say, I, I don't, I can't speak broadly, but I think especially for two men having children, um, you know, our society, there's a lot of messaging that women are the primary caretakers. It's changing now, but, um, you know, my husband and I grew up thinking that women were the primary caretakers. So I think for us, there was a lot around proving that we could do it. We could do it well and that we could, um, we could be great parents. And so those first year and a half were really like intense. But what we realized at that time was that, um, a couple of things, first of all, like two, you know, professional dads and one child, it's a lot of responsibility for a child to have two parents. Like, um, but we also realized that like she's adopted and her experience of adoption, my husband and I don't have those experiences. And we felt like it would be really nice to, for her to grow up into a family that had another child that was adopted, they could experience it together. And then the other thing that really, we, a very close friend, um, her name is Kathy, asked us, you know, d does your family feel complete? Does it feel and we couldn't answer that question. And that's really when we were like, we're ready to have, you know, a second child. Um, so yeah, so that's how we got there. How did she learn that she was adopted then? Was, was were you just very open about it? Early yeah. on and, and so we've been open from the day she was born. We've, you know, shared with her, um, you know, obviously when children are like th three months old, they don't see much, but, when she got, you know, four or five, six months, we had we showed pictures of her birth family. Um, there are a lot of adoption books out there. And so we, you know, we've always had those books available. And so we've always been completely transparent. Um, and it's always just been part of uh, part of our family. And it's it's just nor it's just the, our normal. And two professionals. Yeah. having child did you one or both of you get uh, paternity leave yeah so great great question and um i just did a panel a few weeks ago on paternity leave um yeah so thank you uh to the state of california it has um really great laws it's not the case across the country um both of us work for companies that have paternity leave policies in place, but the state of California basically has a three month paternity leave. Six weeks of it is paid, um, partial pay. It's not your salary, but it's partial pay. Um, and then our employers both had, um, you know, I, I believe for my first adoption, I think the first month was fully paid between two weeks of paternity leave. And then the second was vacation. And then the last next six weeks, the partial pay my husband, very similar. The other thing that we had is both of our companies had adoption assistance programs. Um, and so they reimburse you for the cost of the adoption. So both of our companies did that. And I don't, I think for our first adoption, we ended up, we had upfront a lot of costs, but then we're reimbursed for those, but we both took three months off. Oh. So we were there, um, which is really, you know, like an amazing time. And we both just completely checked out of work. So for my daughter, I took off the time first um, due to like my schedule was more um, flexible at the time. And my work had like a lot of my projects had finished. My my husband um, for a second child took the first first leave. Um, so we've we've both been sort of first up for yeah. the first few months. Yeah. Just a reminder, send us questions. If you have a question for Steve and you're watching on YouTube, you can send us a question via the chat box and they'll make sure to get it to us. We'll start going through questions in just a little bit. Yeah. Um, lots of questions. Okay, two kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, but maybe because you kind of were going in this direction before, I think. Yeah. So you did a you did the adoption in a different way. You didn't yes. go through a private. Uh, yes. From, how did that? So um, for the so for the second adoption, so um, we decided to go through the foster to adopt program, and our decision at that point was um, 
we had our daughter was her adoption was finalized. She was ours forever. So we felt a little bit more like we could take a greater risk with our second adoption. The statistics around a uh, foster to adopt is that um, about 10 to 25 percent of children in the foster to adopt program actually are returned to their biological families. So we took that we decided to take that risk. At the time when we did that, um, we, uh, we were f much more focused on the adopt part of the foster to adopt. Um, we thought that the foster was a step to the adopt, but in California, um, what we have is called um, concurrent planning where there's an adoption plan that's moving forward and there's also a reunification plan that's moving forward for the child to be reunited with the birth family. And there's a entire system, social service system set up helping the biological family get um, the services they need in order to reunify with that child. So um, we decided that we wanted to go the second route. We had a, cu we had a, a, um, a couple, uh, um, they're very good friends, Alana and Marlene, that had gone through the Foster to Adopt program and they had very quick adoptions. And um, they had both very, um, you know, infants. And so we, based on that, we decided to go to, through the foster adopt program. Yeah. Differences, challenges. Um, yeah. So what was your experience? In, yeah, yeah. So they were starkly different. Um, it's part of the reason my book is titled Faith, Resilience, and Love um, is that um, the first adoption, there were some hiccups in the beginning, some challenges. Um, our second adoption through the Foster to Adopt program, it looked at some points like our son was potentially going to be reunited with his biological family. Um, and it was very traumatic uh, to go through that. Um, so Foster to Adopt parents they have like all of the responsibility of being a parent but you have no legal rights and you really have no control over anything so um it's it's really really challenging emotionally we we um and that's what i write about in my book because at the t when i decided to write the book there were a lot of books that were available about the, the process what you need to do how do you go through but i wanted to actually share like I share some of that in my book, but I also really wanted to share the journey, the, the human journey of going through the ups and downs of what it's like. Cause I think that's the part that, you know, people don't give you insight to that. And that what I really hope to get uh, across to people is that it's, it's tumultuous. It's, it's really um, can be very challenging. Now every situation is different with adoption. And so, uh, there are people that have had adoptions that are very simple and straightforward for our son. When they called us, they said the birth parents are not in the picture. Um, while their birth rights have not been relinquished, this should move through very quickly. Um, two days after he came into our home, actually it was the next day mm -hmm. they said um, birth mom has resurfaced and she wants to see him and she wants to uh, reunify with him. Mm -hmm. um, so we had for a period of six months, we had twice weekly visits with her, with um, our son would see him, uh, see her twice a week as she was trying to um, take advantage of the services in order to get healthy to take him back. So that was a, that was a really shocking and she was doing really well and they were starting to talk about, well, maybe we'll do overnight visits where she could have him overnight. And those were really, um, you know, that was really terrifying because that what that those steps were saying was she's being viewed in the eyes of the court as being able and ready to take take him back. Um, and so I recall very vividly um dropping him off for visits with her. And then I would get back in the car and I would drive around the corner corner and I would park and just break down and just, you know, think like this could, at some point he could be away from us. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and then 
I had to stop thinking about myself and my pain. And I had to really go deep and really uh, say this is, this is about him and we've got to do what we need to do for him. Um, and so push aside my own pain in order to make sure that we were providing what was best for him. And if it was best for him to be reunified with his family, then we would have to get through that somehow. So I think that's the, um, the foundation of, you know, foster adopt policies. And at the end of the day, it's, it's definitely not what, you know, you, what you want. And it's such yes. a selfless yes. act, yes. Uh, which leads me to, yeah. you know, there's, California is extremely progressive yeah. uh, compared to many other states out there yes. and LGBTQ parents yeah. in, you know, adopting or forming yes. families currently. Um, I, I mean, we don't, we don't know, right. There's a lot that we don't know what's happening right now with this pandemic, but there are some cases that the yes. Supreme court yes. is hearing that impacts LGBTQ yes. prospective parents. And that is the question if yes. adoption agencies um, or businesses out there could turn away yes. LGBTQ people yeah. for religious reasons. Yes. And so, you know, I'd love to, to hear what you have to say as someone who wrote your, you know, wrote about your journey, yeah. wants to share your journey, especially the human side of this yeah. and what's at stake and how damaging it could be if the courts decide against yes. the community. So it's very scary and it's very real because the Supreme Court has decided to see this case. So a lower court decided that it was um, illegal for an adoption agency to um, discriminate against LGBTQ people but the Supreme Court decided to see that, to, to take on that case. Um, so the, 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 the sadness here is it's twofold. So LGBTQ people that want to have children through adoption, there's sadness and loss because they won't be able to do it. But the fact is that I believe the number is six to one of LGBTQ people adopting children out of the foster system. So if this does stand the number of children that will stay in the foster system in states that will allow this to happen um, will be huge. So there's over, I think it's 450,000 children currently in the foster system. Um, and so the impact on creating forever families for these children is going to be tremendous. Um, so, these, these policies that are potentially coming down from the Trump administration and from the Supreme Court will have impact on individual children, but culturally the impact of children not living in a, and, and foster families can be very stable environments, so I don't wanna say that, but um, uh, without having a adoptive family and not having a path to that, now potentially, more straight people will step up to the plate and adopt kids out of the foster system, and that will be great. But the statistics right now is that a, lar a lot of LGBTQ people are the ones that are going through the foster system. So it's very sad for our community. And the other thing that's sad about it is that adoption is, through the foster system, is um, virtually free because the states you know, pay for that. Whereas um, for LGBTQ people that are not able to adopt, they're then going to have to go the route of surrogacy. There is no international gay adoption anymore or LGBTQ adoption. So they're going to have to go the route of surrogacy, which is a very expensive proposition. So it's going to impact lower income LGBTQ people. It's going to um, just really have a trickle down effect. Yeah. As and I think this will happen even more once the book is released, but as you've become kind of publicly known as an LGBTQ father, um, what are you hearing are like the, from other LGBTQ folks who either want to become parents or have become parents? What are have are, what do they struggle with most? What what are their biggest issues? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I mean, I think. It depends on, it largely depends on where you live. So um, San Francisco is, um, you know, it's a you know, very LGBTQ queer place. There are a lot of LGBTQ parents. So we don't live in San Francisco. We live 
10 miles south of San Francisco in our daughter's public school. Um, we don't know any other, there's 600 students yeah. there. We don't know any other LGBTQ families, none. Okay. So, so for our family and for other families, it's a lot of education. A lot of the educational system is heteronormative. There's not a lot of uh, storylines or, um, you know, imaging of LGBTQ people. And that takes a tremendous amount of effort. So I sit on the board for our family coalition, which does a lot of work around education for LGBTQ families and advocacy and policy work. And um, it's part of the reason I'm on the board because where I live right now, you know, I'm going to the teacher, su principal, superintendent, you know, what books are LGBTQ friendly? What images do you have? Every year with a new teacher, we start over. So it's really, um, so it's, it's, it's challenging. Now that's in the Bay Area and everyone's very accepting once you bring, bring it to them, but get outside of the Bay and you're in Kentucky or in, you know, um, I don't know, Utah or some other place. Central that's, Valley. Yeah, yeah. That it's, it's a very different story, right? Like, so the onus and burden on the, 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 the queer parents is really huge. Um, so, yeah. Let's talk about COVID-19 and how it's oh, wow. impacted your family. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned, you know, coming out during the HIV AIDS yeah. epidemic, uh, last big, huge, yeah. um, you know, epidemic that's impacted our community. Yeah. yeah. And, and in your book, you t describe, you know, what it felt like for you to see people in our community uh, get sick, yes. pass away, but also yeah. what was happening politically, the disinformation and, yeah. you know, um, be great to hear your thoughts on kind of that, what that feeling is like now today, yeah. but the difference is you're not yeah. just coming out and you're not in your twenties. I mean, you're a dad, you have two kids, you're yeah. a husband, yeah. um, a community member. We're in a different time. So I think that, you know, I mean, yes. So I came out during the AIDS epidemic and, um, I had a neighbor who lived across the street from me and it was, it was 92. And so I was just really kind of like getting my footing and, um, was still s telling some people I was by and was not really fully out. And I had a neighbor, it, they were a couple. And then all of a sudden one of them disappeared and I was like, what's going on here? And it was two men. And then I'm, and subsequently met one of them and he had AIDS and, um, you know, I was uh, over the next year was got to know him and became sort of a, a caretaker and then was there when he died. Um, I think the, the big contrast um, is that um, on top of the uh, epidemic of AIDS was all the shame and hate and um, disinformation and fear and um that was a huge burden for people that were sick. That's very different than what we have today because AIDS was, um, is transmitted through um, bodily fluids, whereas what we're experiencing today is, is a much more casual um, uh, encounter with um, the virus. So I think it's very different, but I think for a lot of us who grew up in the early 90s um, with the AIDS epidemic, we're, we are... Like, this is how it felt for us, this level of fear. Um, so I think that that's a, like a big contrast. Um, but also the, the route of, uh, of transmission for, for COVID is, is much more casual route. And so it requires a level of um, uh, scrutiny and diligence that was different with HIV uh, AIDS. Um, and that there was, you know, you could... There were a lot of men that were in relationship that were HIV positive and HIV negative. I dated men that were HIV positive and knew what were sort of the, the, the parameters of safe, safe sex so, so you wouldn't get. That's very different than what we're experiencing right now. Um, the fear, I think the fear is the same. Um, the disinformation is, I think, is probably more now because of the vastness of media that didn't exist at that time. Um, for us, for my family, so my kids are off school. The governor yesterday, 
Governor Newsom, I love you, but you said something about schools being closed for the rest of the year. Um, it's, you know, we're both trying to work and, you know, I have a four-year-old and an eight-year-old. The four-year-old is, it's, it's a very challenging, um, to get them to, um, sit at home. And I'm also, um, I don't want them in front of a computer screen for, you know, six or eight hours a day. So I want them to do active learning where it's, you know, they're sitting and looking at books. And so it's challenging. It's going to be challenging. Uh, it's going to be very challenging for, uh, and we're only what today's Thursday. We're only day four. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. We're eating. So, I mean, like the food's going through the house, like so much faster, like, cause they ate at school and, you know, like, meals like breakfast was very like now it's just like like i can't even believe like we're going through food and it's that's kind of crazy yeah I, I, we, i've been talking to a number of parents uh <coughs> who, who, have, who are confronting that exact thing yeah. suddenly i've got a job but i'm now doing it from home and i'm homeschooling my kids yeah um i think a lot of them will be kind of trying to assign kids like hey let's see how much you can learn by cleaning out the basement or something yes but um you, we kind of started here talking about, you know, you acknowledging your privilege and such. Um, and I, I, I just listening to what you were saying, I was just thinking what lucky kids, though, to have two loving parents. Yes. Who can afford, you know, the, yeah. to, to at least get that food yeah. and all that stuff. Yes. Um, yes. Are there, I mean, our family coalition, I mean, do they do anything to help? less well off? Yes. Yes. So our family coalition um, in... I, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that they're doing. Um, our interim executive director right now really um, saw this as moving pretty quickly. And so um, our family coalition does a lot of um, in-person programming for queer families. And basically like three weeks ago, they started to move everything online to create virtual programming. Um, and so they're um, a hub for, um, these programs so they're continuing to go on but then as far as resources for families as as many of you know that a lot of the counties are providing you know three meals a day for families that are low-income families yeah. san mateo county right you know half a block from our house there's a middle school that's providing three meals a day um and so i think that's helpful i think the bigger issue i mean I, um i so my brother owns a business in southern california small you know, cafe and he and I had a conversation last night and he's, um, very dedicated to his employees and he's just struggling with how do I keep them employed? And it's really from a place of, um, if they don't have a paycheck, they don't have any reserves and how are they going to live? Like we're really getting to the nitty gritty with this. Um, and so I think, that that's really scary. It wasn't that long ago that we were talking about the that research that showed that most American families yes. could yes. not handle a four hundred dollar emergency, yeah. and already, yeah, you know, tens of thousands of people are losing their jobs. Yeah, they're having wages cut. I mean, yeah. And I think that the proposals about sending out these checks is a great idea, but I think that actually the the way it should be done is the lower income people should be receiving much larger checks higher income people should be receiving lower checks. This idea of one size fits all is ridiculous because the impact to the lower income people is so much greater. Um, and so, you know, I think that, and I, I, we are very lucky. Um, I will say that as we all know, the Bay area, our houses are small. So it's really hard to like, like actually conduct business when, you know, your house is, you know, 1400 square feet and you're kind of already on top of each other. Um, it's really hard to get work done and, but everyone's in the same, sh you know, my son keeps running in my, my uh, husband's on conference calls all the time. And my son keeps running in like, no, don't go in there. You know, he's <laughs> under, you know, he just keeps running in for those meetings, but everyone's under the I, same. I was just going to, it's, yeah. it's, you know, and they're, they're kind of getting to know the family <laughs> through these interruptions. So it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's strange. It's very strange. So what are your kids um, saying to you? What are they asking? What's their response to what's happening? You know, the um, they are, um, they are um, asking questions. And to be honest with you, 
Lorvik last night had a really in-depth conversation with my daughter. My son doesn't really quite, he's four, he doesn't really quite get it. Um, but they're, they're really kind of, they're, they're afraid, they're scared. Um, they're, um, they're not sure like how they get it and like what, you know, like what's going to happen. And as many children are afraid of their parents getting sick um, and dying, it's a real fear. So I think there's a lot of fear. I think there's also for them is also kind of excitement too, because they're home. Mm -hmm. They get to be with their parents all day long, which, you know, our kids have been in daycare, right? Like, you know, our daughter um, started at two, my son started at a year old, like they're used to being in daycare every day. So there's a part of it, I think they're actually kind of like enjoying like, not having the structure and like, goofing around and, you know, so, um, so yeah. As we wind down, you know, um, we started off by talking about your how growing up in an Irish Catholic you know family and household how that all led to yeah your strong beliefs as well as the the want for a family yeah. of your own yeah and now that you have a family of your own we're as a as a world as human beings are impacted by this pandemic we're all hunkering down and and yes. want to do our best because we want the tomorrows we want the future yes. to come we want it to be a better yes. place and everybody to be healthy. Yes. So that's coming. I think that, you know, yes. that that's coming. But for you as a dad and addressing the fact that your kids are afraid today, I mean, what kind of world do you see in their future? And and also as a gay dad, right? And yeah. them already being exposed to a lot of injustices yeah. you know, for, for their four and eight years old. <laughs> They've yeah, already I mean, seen a lot. They've already experienced a lot. Yeah. I mean, I think for, you know, for Lorvik and I, um, you know, we had so much lack of control with our adoptions that we're kind of like, we're used to like, you know, I mean, we're used to like the unknown, like it's just kind of like reality. Like, um, so I think we've had some dry runs with these two adoptions for something like this. I think for other people who haven't had this type of experience, it's, it's, it's traumatic. It's really, um, you know, this desire, our culture is very motivated desire towards control, this desire where there is not a lot of control right now. And we have to really dig deep and um, be okay with that. Um, I think for our kids and the future, I think I'm, I'm afraid that, this virus and this the transmission route of this virus is going to make them want to be less physical with people um, because they're going to be afraid that they're going to get sick. And that scares me because my belief is physical touch is very important to our well-being and, um, and our humanity. And so that makes me worried. I'm also worried about um, remote learning and the idea that the computer or, and the, the programs are awesome, but the idea that that can become a substitute for human interactions in classrooms, that worries me. Um, because we see in our culture, there's more advanced we get with technology, there's greater isolation and depression. And so my concerns are really around like, you know, do we get back to actually, um, really embracing each other when this is over. And it, you know, it sounds like it could go on for a long time. So do behaviors change enough that people aren't be able to spring back to being affectionate and being willing to sit next to people and being like, Oh, you sneezed and like, what's going on here? That, that really concerns me. I, I think you've, you've identified just the uncertainty of it. That, that is a big thing. If we knew this was going to be three months. That's long. Yeah. Okay, well, we need to come up with systems yeah. to help families and help businesses and everyone get through this. Yeah. But not knowing it's going to be three months, uh, there's talk about this basically being a wave, going down in the summer, yeah. Yeah. warm months, yeah. and coming back in the fall. Um, it's, it's uneasy yes. to, yeah. to be a part of any of this. Um, and I just always kind of take my hat off to parents who have, yeah. they don't have to just worry about themselves. They have to worry about... Yeah their kids. Yeah. I mean, I think the bottom line is like, you know, we as a people hope, you know, like hope and love. And those are the things I mean, and this is a lot of my journey is around these things. Darkness comes, fear comes, anxiety comes, and then there's hope, 
right? And like, so there is darkness here and there is fear and there is, it's all very real. Um, and there's also in the midst of that, we have the human capacity to love and to be hopeful and to have faith that we will come, come together again. So, mm -hmm. Can I have, so how old were you when you got your daughter? Ooh. Um, how old was I when I got my daughter? She's eight. Um, I was 45. Okay. Yeah. So had you had 45, everyone, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the question. <laughs> how old? No. Um, <laughs> what, what I wanted to ask was if you had gone through this 15 years earlier or something, yeah. do you think it would have been a different father or how do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. You know, um, being an older parent is challenge. I mean, you, on the one hand for us, we've, had good professional lives that we're, you know, have more financial stability, but physically it's just very challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, um, for Lorvik, he's, he's very resilient with the lack of sleep, but, um, the lack of sleep yeah. is challenging with kids at, as you're older in life. Um, you can bounce back from it, um, more quickly. The other thing is, you know, they're sick all the time. Um, and as you're, you know, I'm 50, I'm going to be 53 in June as you're an older parent, you know, it's like, it's just, you, you, you're sick longer. And, um, so I would say those are the challenges, like being younger, you have maybe less resource, depending on where you're at, you have less resource. You also have less life experience. Um, so there are kind of pluses and minuses on both sides. What about all of these cousins and family members? Do they help with their, their new, what grand nephew or, Oh, my, I mean, so, uh, unfortunately I was at a funeral in January. Um, one of my first cousins passed away from cancer and, um, you know, my, my cousins were super close and they were just, you know, they just are like, love my kids. My kids weren't with me, but they, they know my kids and they're just, you know, they're just a huge support. Yeah. So it's amazing. Yeah. So your book determined to be dad. Yeah. A journey of faith, resilience, and love is out when and when can people get yeah, their hands so, on it? Yeah, um, so the launch date is June 16th. It will be available on Amazon on June 16th. So if you're uh, interested in reading more, um, June 16th is the date it will be available. I'm, I'm hopeful that it will be distributed more broadly. That's work I'm doing right now. And your kids, I'm sure they saw you you know, up yeah. all night writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, so, so they know about the book and so it's they coming do, out. They do. My daughter is very aware, actually. She wanted to do the book cover because she likes art a lot. And um, I decided that for my first book, I would not do that with her. And so we were, we're talking about actually doing a kid's book together where I would write the story and she would actually do the artwork. So That's super yeah. cool. That's super cute. Steve, thank you for sharing thank your you. journey thank and you your stories. Me. Yeah, it was great to be here. Thank, thank you, you so much. No, no handshakes. No handshakes. <laughs> we're we're going to do the jazz hands and yeah. say goodbye to you. And thank you so much for joining us for our very first or my mine, Michelle, the Michelle Miao show program at the Commonwealth Club with our co-host, uh, John Zipper. And we have so much more, at least for now until we're told that we can't and all that we can do is keep telling each other that we're in this together um, and that there will be better days ahead of us. More programming, you can check it out at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. And like we said earlier, we're all impacted. The Commonwealth Club is impacted. We want to keep the work going. We need your help. And you could do that by going to commonwealthclub.org. John, Thank did I miss you? Thank you for joining us. CommonwealthClub.org slash online will show you our ongoing list of upcoming programs. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, you so much. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Great.